Hi, I'm Tom Edwards. I'm the Chief Digital and Data Officer for Omnicom Health Group, and I'm also a professional futurist. And I love to talk about the intersection of emerging technology and consumer behavior. So for the last 20 years, I've talked a lot about how disruption was the new normal and how new technologies were taking and redefining our experiences and our expectations. But now, what I'm seeing is it's less about disruption. And it really is more about a convergence. It's not just about artificial intelligence or augmented reality or the metaverse or Web3, but it's, a, it's an accelerated convergence of all of these elements coming together that's fundamentally transforming to where technology is culture, culture is technology. Every single industry is being disrupted and transformed right now based on the amount of data that's available, as well as the rise of intelligent systems and algorithms. And today, we're going to spend time breaking down some of these foundational changes from behavior to technology. And what I like to do, I like to infuse pop culture into the conversation. So you'll see, you'll see Star Wars, you'll see gaming like Fortnite and Roblox discussed, you'll see Stranger Things and Pixar movies and The Matrix and The Minority Report. All of these pop culture references are really designed to take and distill down highly complex concepts into easily relatable interactions. All right, so here we go. So before we talk about the future, I like to talk about the past, specifically Star Wars. This property had a significant impact on how I view the world, the career path that I chose uh, during the late 70s. So, while most of my friends really wanted to be Luke Skywalker or Han Solo, I loved the droids. They seemed to enable the main characters every step of the way. But growing up in the early 80s, you know, this was more reality. <laughs> this is Robbie the Robot from the original Nintendo Entertainment System. And unfortunately, Robbie didn't quite meet the expectations that I had set from all of my interactions with all of the Star Wars franchises over time. But as we move into the 90s and into the early 2000s, there's hope. So we begin to see the rise of connectivity. And who remembers who had the Motorola Razor? Yeah? We're trying to text with that, the three numbers, the three letters. Anyway. So as we begin to drive forward, something happened in 2007. Many people think that this moment was when we really saw true transformational innovation. Now just remember, innovation is actually just removing a barrier while building upon the familiar. And so with the launch of the original iPhone, you saw this consolidation of media, camera, all these things into one specific device. But I argue that the actual transformational innovation didn't happen in 2007. It was actually 2008 with the launch of the App Store. This is what really sent us down a path to where we want to control our experiences. We now have an expectation to personalize our experiences. And this comes from the original App Store. Since the, since the launch, we've had 180 billion downloads of applications. But it's this tailoring of expectations that's really foundational to everything that we're going to discuss today. So when I break down all of these different technologies and all these different aspects and elements that are impacting and influencing change, I really look at four core filters. Empower. Empower is all about giving users control. Every iteration over the past few years is leading towards this idea of empowerment of the individual and control. Next is exponential. Exponential is all about the rise of intelligent systems. This is all about the rise of data, algorithms, and all the other key elements tied to virtual assistants, and I'll talk about different levels of autonomy with exponential. Enhanced. Enhanced is really that connection between physical and digital reality. And it's focusing on when our environment is going to adapt to us versus us adapting to it. The final section is a new section. It's called experience. Experience is how we evolve our mindset to fully understand all of the shifts and changes that are happening around us. And how can we capitalize on these specific changes within our individual businesses? All right. Let's start with empower. And again, empower is all about control. We're going to talk about Gen Z. 
We're going to talk about how the lens is life. We're going to talk about private messaging, and we're going to end on this idea of the bridge to intelligence. But again, it's all about this behavioral expectation that we have to control our experiences. So these are, these are my kids. This is Gavin, Audrey, and Grant, 2017, 14. They're part of Gen, they're part of Gen Z. Gen Z is 1996 to 2010. They're part of the first mobile first generation. They basically learn to swipe before they learn to speak. And their, spe their specific expectations around technology and experiences are having a significant impact on how experiences and business will be done. They currently represent over 40% of consumers, 40%. And again, their behaviors have a significant impact. Let's start diving into it. So let's talk about gaming for just a minute. 96% of Gen Z games. The question isn't, do you play? It's, what do you play? They spend an hour and a half a day in virtual worlds, inside of games, inside of basically developing social communities. It's a way to interact, it's a way to connect. And I'm partial to it as well. I've been a gamer since I can remember and I've instilled that in my own kids. My oldest son, Gavin, is, uh, is, an, is a professional esports athlete. And again, it's been a big part of our family moving forward. Now, why does gaming matter from a technology perspective? What you're seeing are basically the foundational elements of the metaverse starting within gaming. You may or may not have heard the term metaverse. Basically 46% of people have actually heard the term, even less know what it actually means. Think about as the internet in three dimensions, in 3D. It's basically taking all these various collections of communities and experiences and expanding and enhancing them. So games like Fortnite that you see here on the screen, what you're seeing is an example from the Travis Scott concert that happened in-game. 28 million people viewed this across devices. So 12 million viewed it in-game. Others watched it via other platforms, whether streaming platforms, etc., via Twitch, YouTube, and others connected in different ways. But what you're seeing is accessibility. You're seeing community. And what I see in my own kids is it's a way in which they communicate with their friends. So again, Discord is a huge part of this now in terms of the, the community aspect of it as well. Gaming on PC, console, or wherever with cloud-based gaming. Very important. Now, as you think about what's happening with Roblox, it's really interesting. Roblox doesn't necessarily call itself a gaming platform anymore. It's more of an experience. 43 million people log in daily to Roblox. And you're seeing a number of brands really driving into the creative aspect of the game. Now, when I met with the, the Epic Creative team the last Fortnite World Cup, we were having a conversation. And one thing that blew my mind is that as people play Fortnite, most people think of it in the traditional Battle Royale sense. 90% of the interaction happens in the creative mode. And that truly is amplified here within the Roblox platform. Because what it actually is, it's a user-generated content platform. You have very young individuals who are learning how to code and craft and create these experiences and they can monetize those experiences. So what you're seeing on screen now is Nike land. So you're seeing Nike now taking and driving their own avatars, showcasing real world physical products, applying them to digital avatars. And essentially there's an entire economy that's developed around this. I think my own son spent a, a few thousand dollars on Fortnite skins <laughs> over the course of a few years. And what's really interesting, there's more social clout in virtual Jordans than there are physical now. Just think about that. Me as a kid growing up in the 80s with the original OG Jordans, like that blows my mind. So step, taking a step back and understanding, going from the metaverse, you may also hear the term Web3. Now they're two different things, but interrelated in some way. So let's, let's dive into this a little bit. Web1 was the original web. Think about, you know, building out your GeoCities page. It's very, it's very much read-only, HTML-driven. Then we had the rise of Web 2.0. This is the participatory web. This is where you see the rise of big tech. Facebook, now Meta, Twitter, Snap, Google, all of these other platforms that are really taking, driving, consolidating the data around you as an individual, trying to figure out seamless ways to interact, give you contextual marketing along the way. Web 3, what we're moving towards is the decentralized web. What that essentially means, again, bringing it back to the foundational idea within Empower, 
It's all about control. You control your data. You control the different experiences. You're controlling all of the information that exists around this, and you're controlling your specific currency with cryptocurrency, etc. So when you think about the differences between Web 1 and Web 2 and Web 3, and how that then interrelates to, to the metaverse, Web 3, you may have heard of the term blockchain. Blockchain is essentially distributed ledgers that essentially can take and authenticate any specific transaction so you can actually tie and append ownership. You may have also heard the term NFT. So an NFT is a non-fungible token. Think of it as like a digital collectible. There's, a, there's been a lot of discussion around this. NFTs are actually, most NFTs are actually based on what's called the Ethereum blockchain. And you can purchase them with Ether. That's a type of currency. Now, NFTs are relevant from a marketing perspective. Why? Well, what you can do is you can append different elements or types of content within an actual NFT. It can be a, a membership. Uh, it could be a membership card. You can append music. You can append different types of content. So there's, you can append physical items to an NFT. So there are so many different ways in which that this idea of ownership of you specifically owning a specific item is yours. So what you see on screen now, this is my specific NFT collection. So the, to the very far left, that's my very first NFT I ever purchased. I've minted a few over time. But one thing that's really interesting to me as I think about all the different use cases out there is really what StockX is doing with their Vault X NFTs. So their StockX Vault NFTs. So what's interesting here is that as they mint a specific NFT, it's tied to a physical object that's tangible. So you're not necessarily buying the physical shoe. The physical shoe is just associated with the actual NFT. Why would this, why would this kind of matter over time? Think about this from even purchasing of a vehicle. So imagine in the near future, you're actually purchasing the NFT and the smart contract is tied to that. And the physical vehicle just comes with it. But yet you're able to take your car and drive it through whatever other metaverse experience that enables or allows that moving forward. So as our world becomes more digitized, as we continue to blend between physical and digital, there's going to be a blending of these physical and digital objects, including our vehicles. Now, another, another element of this that we can talk about are called POAPs. They're basically, think of it like a virtual ticket stub. So instead of having that physical ticket stub in hand, you can actually take and associate with whatever specific event and they become bookmarks of your life and of the various experiences that you've had. So you can issue these, they're, uh, they're, they're a type of NFT, but they're not necessarily worth anything from a, from a dollar value perspective. But still, from a marketing standpoint, you can take and highlight your specific event and associate in that way. Now, all of this again is moving to where We've got individual users, we've got, we've got different groups that are taking and controlling these kind of diversified organizations that are essentially taking and building up these different communities that are owned by these users. You can even purchase virtual land like in Decentraland or create virtual objects or pretty much do anything you want to in these kind of foundational metaverse-based experiences and drive it forward. But again, it's this idea of control. Now let's, let's bring it back to us as the individuals and kind of our expectations for just a moment beyond just gaming. So think about the camera. I think about the camera as a capture device. We take about 400 million selfies every day. <laughs> Anybody take one in the last 30 minutes? Save space, it's okay. But for Gen Z, it's a communication device. It's about presence. It's about this constant ability to stay connected. My daughter, this is my daughter Audrey, she will not make an actual phone call any type of communication she has is going to incorporate some type of FaceTime element in it. She wants to see her friend. Sometimes they'll just have the devices on, be doing other things, but still just be able to talk to that individual depending on what they're doing. And it's not just with video and communication. So 69% of Gen Z actually thinks of themselves as a creator. So 66% own their own YouTube channel and 83% have played with some form of augmented reality filter. Why does this matter? A majority of these types of experiences set an expectation for what they're going to expect from brands and organizations moving forward as we continue to blend this line between physical and digital. 
One of the triggers I look for when evaluating technology and how it's going to truly scale is really the, the, the eco, the third party ecosystems that are essentially tied to these emerging platforms and the level of investment being made by the organizations. So you think about different AR experiences like Spark AR with Meta, or you look at what Google is doing, or you look at what Apple is doing to enable third parties. This is a very key driver for how these technologies are going to accelerate and drive mass adoption, which is key. Speaking of mass adoption, private messaging has actually surpassed open social since like 2016. So the ability to take, most millennials actually expect to have a conversation with a brand. 69% of them want to have a conversation with a brand 24 hours a day. So they're okay with taking and driving a specific you know, connection. And within that single conversational thread, you're able to create hundreds of different types of ways in which to communicate and work through any type of interaction with that individual from developing kind of a preference center and collecting information about how that what their key preferences are to driving to a specific location. So if you want to drive to a retail location or specifically to an HCP or wherever else, that's fully feasible now. But not only is it about kind of communication and connection, it's also about integrating some of these elements of the camera into redefining how we shop, how we interact, and the expectation that we have, again, with physical and digital items. Here's an example from Kia, where they're able to take a Facebook mess or a meta messenger experience and actually showcase in a physical space what the potential car would look like. This is fantastic, especially during the recent lockdown, because then you could actually see virtually what the vehicle looked like. And it's not just about digital elements. Again, it's this combination of physical and digital. What you're seeing on the screen is a two dimensional card that you're then able to take through basically looking through an iPhone and actually convert that into a gesture based interface to where you can interact with it digitally. So this is going to be a continual theme as the camera becomes a bridge to intelligence. All right, that's empower. That's all about control and how users can control. Next, we're going to talk about exponential. Exponential is all about intelligent systems and how we can take and expand upon all the, the massive amount, the quintillions of bytes of data that exist and actually be able to understand the signals and drive that back into helping to create and craft new experiences. Now, when it comes to intelligent systems, I've done research across every single generational cohort. And what I've found overwhelmingly is that ease and convenience is the number one reason why people will take and adopt intelligent systems to further drive or you know enhance their lives. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about Pixar movies. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about virtual assistants, and we're going to talk about the proxy web. All right. Who likes Pixar movies? Pretty much everyone, right? Who's heard of the Pixar theory? The Pixar theory states that every single Pixar movie, from The Good Dinosaur all the way through to, to Monsters, Inc., happen on a single timeline. So, and it shows the rise and fall of humanity. Heard my Texas accent a little bit there. Now, we see the introduction of AI in The Incredibles with the Omnidroid. You see it begins to become, it, it learns as it battles the different superheroes over time. But the interesting thing is, Incredibles 2 actually revealed the true master plan. The master plan, it's not about a hostile takeover. It's not about, you know, any of that. What it is, it's about ease and convenience. And I've covered the eyes of the innocent here <laughs> as we look at Wally looking on here to a few individuals. So let's talk a little bit about this whole idea around AI, what it is, why we think about it in certain ways, and what it actually is. So when you think about it, AI is any type of system or robot that has the ability to derive human discernment. So that's an important kind of nuance here in terms of this versus other technologies. Think about like, uh, like the Internet of Things. Now, there are three types of AI. There's artificial narrow intelligence. Think about your Alexa or your Google Assistant. Artificial general intelligence, again, going back to my gamers, think about Cortana from Halo. And there's 
basically super intelligence. This is where a lot of our science fiction comes into play, from Skynet from the Terminators or Ultron from the Avengers or HAL 9000 for you know 2001 Space Odyssey. But the reality is, take all of that and put it aside, we're actually in a golden age of AI right now. And there are three primary reasons. One, the cost of hardware is significantly decreasing over time. And this is a graphical processing unit that you can see on screen. It's both for processing both visual as well as traditional processing. And also we have to think about just the insane amount of data that's actually created. We create 2.5 quintillion. That's 18 zeros worth of data every day. The ability to take all of that unstructured information and begin to make sense of that and apply that into action against our core businesses or business needs or identification of these various use cases, it's getting to the point now where you have to have intelligent systems and algorithms in order to do that. Speaking of algorithms, that's the third reason why we're in this golden age of AI. Now, you, you know, you can think, you may have heard the term algorithm in the past. A very simple analog to this is thinking about baking a cake. You're following a finite set of instructions that leads to a tangible end result. An algorithm is the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning. So it's a form of artificial intelligence. It's probably the one that most of you have heard about recently over the last few years, especially in business. Machine learning is simply human coded algorithms. It's to where somebody, some human is training a model that is then taking and beginning to learn over time. Now, one of my favorite examples of machine learning is tied to image processing, and I love this example. So this is an example of a system trying to learn and discern between what's actually a chihuahua and what's a blueberry muffin. And it's taking and learning based on the density of the pixels on the, on the screen tied to the image to then be able to then predict out, okay, this is a chihuahua, this is a blueberry muffin. As models are continuing to become more sophisticated, we also then shift into natural language processing or NLP. Anyone who owns an Alexa smart device or any type of Google Assistant or even Siri, natural language processing takes a form of linguistics and applies them to machine learning. It's actually taking your voice, converting that into text, and then taking and applying that through this, through this corpus of knowledge and information to retrieve back a response to you, all in real time which is amazing, and it's a precursor to where things are going. Now, another facet is called deep learning. So do you, you may have heard of systems that can train themselves to either play a video game or win at Go or you know, rapidly go through and understand how to speed run Super Mario. Well, when it comes to, let's bring it back to you for just a second. When it comes to your meta feed, and you think about this for a second, the content that's actually served to you is actually being driven by a deep learning algorithm. So deep learning, it's basically based on the human brain. So it's these convolutional neural networks that are taking and learning over time. You're seeing deep learning being applied in a majority of the big tech solutions that we depend on every day. From your meta feed all the way through to Google search results, deep learning plays a critical role in basically now our everyday world. And for a long time, the practical application of AI in business was really around extraction, summarization, doing different types of weightings, and all these other different things. But moving forward, there have been so many new models developed that are generative. So what you're seeing on the screen is you're actually seeing these images that were generated based off of pure keywords. So you take the keyword avocado and chair, put them into the system, and out comes the rendering of these various images, all driven by AI. And it's not just images, it's also text. So being able to take now and create very complex, you know, even taking and doing high level medical summarization of, of key medical journals and taking and driving that through. Some of our research has found that with these kind of generative systems and these summation systems, you can actually give a higher score than if it was written by an actual medical writer at a fraction of the time. So if you begin to think about the practical application within marketing alone for copy generation, et cetera, it becomes something that's very important to consider and follow closely, these generative models. Now, when it comes to applying AI to business, I'm a big believer in intelligence augmentation. 
that these systems, these algorithms, these intelligent systems are all based to help us better understand our world around us, make us smarter, enable us to get focus on the things that we can actually take and, and apply strategic thought to versus going through the process of manually sorting through all of this information to try to find that core insight. It's also incredibly key because the next evolution of experiences are going to be highly predicated on the ability to predict predictive decisioning. Very, very, very key moving forward. And we'll touch more about that in the enhanced section, but predictive decisioning, predictive analytics, predictive algorithms are incredibly key to help deliver this idea of ease and convenience across experiences. Also, we're moving from this time of the Internet of Things to autonomous things, to where our world is going to be enabled by all of these various autonomous vehicles, drones, etc., that are going to take and, again, enhance our lives. It's all about making our lives easier. Now, when I think about autonomy, I, I break it down into five separate levels of autonomy. So level one is chatbot. Level two is natural language processing assistance. Level three are digital humans. Level four, motive robotics. Level five, Westworld. Why not? Season four coming soon. Let's start with chat. We already touched on private messaging earlier in the empower section. What I didn't talk about, though, were the conversational AI engines that can actually take and power these experiences on the back end. Some of these engines can flex across not only conversational experiences with Messenger, but also are able to be reused for natural language processing solutions like Alexa as well as Google Assistant. And they're very practical in terms of what they can do to drive a certain action from the user that's actively engaging with that, with that, with, with that threat, that conversational threat. Here on the screen, you can see Kian. Kian is Kia's form of a conversational AI. It's able to drive many facets of basically CRM strategy, drive to an actual test drive location, give you whatever information you need to help you facilitate that pre-buy process. Now, going into virtual or to, vo to voice-based assistance for just a moment. Again, these are all based on NLP type systems. You have 90 million people using voice-based assistance every month. There are 8 billion, billion with a B, basically smart devices that are available out in the wild right now. And the key thing to actually consider, many people think that it might be Alexa or Google, Siri is actually the number one used virtual voice-based assistant. So the average user uses 10 basically queries. My wife uses it to find her watch. So she'll ask Siri, hey, find my watch. And there you go. Now, in the car, so the car in and of itself is going to be evolving very quickly as we get to this idea of autonomous vehicles. It'll shift more from, from a utility to an entertainment space. But even in how, you've got 77 million people using voice-based assistance in the car. This is an example of Google with drive time to where it's able to take and focus, just like you see sometimes in your inbox now, where it can focus these specific things for you. But Google's actually taking it a step further. What you're actually seeing on the screen is the Google Assistant acting as a proxy on behalf of an individual. It's actually going through the process of renting a car. Like it literally understands all of your preferences, whether or not you need a car seat, and it's going through the entire process without the individual even having to lift a finger. Again, ease and convenience. Now. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm an AI avatar created entirely by artificial intelligence. Now back to your presentation, Tom. Oh, tell me more about the Pixar theory. I love Wall E. So digital humans are an incredibly important part of how systems are going to evolve. Even from a pharma perspective, let's, let's look at this for just a minute. Right now, there's a heavy dependency on pharmaceutical sales reps. And as the pandemic hit, we, got, we saw more and more and more type of shifting towards this hybrid approach to both virtual and digital. Now, there may be a concerted effort to actually shift towards digital humans. The interesting thing here, what you're seeing on screen is an example of soul machines. And with soul machines, they actually can take and it's a form of emotive AI to where it can basically review the facial expressions that I have convert that into how it's going to respond. And it's got a basis of a corpus of information that it's able to take and 
help me through kind of whatever customer service. You're seeing this actually deployed in financial services areas and others, but these digital avatars are gonna play a bigger role as we move towards this idea of augmenting with a digital workforce. And it's not just digital, we're talking physical as well. So recently Elon Musk talked about how the Optimus, and I immediately think of G1 Transformers with Optimus Prime, etc. But the Optimus robot is eventually going to drive more revenue for Tesla than the actual electronic vehicles. Like that's his prediction. What you're seeing on the screen is this humanoid android that essentially will sell for about $10,000. It's 5'8", 125 pounds. It can lift you know, upwards of 50 to 75 pounds. And it's basically designed to be an extension of you. Go to the grocery store for you, walk the dog, do all of these other specific tasks so that you again can focus on ease and convenience. And again, the idea of emotive robotics taking that, that humanoid form and then creating more and more lifelike, human-like, basically robotic entities that are physical also is something that's continuing to be driven forward. And finally, you have Westworld. <laughs> Not quite there yet. Now, the interesting thing with all of this, as you begin to think, think back to that example of the assistant booking a car on behalf of the individual. I'm a big believer in what's called the proxy web, where my virtual assistant could communicate with your virtual assistant on the back end. If we wanted to have a cup of coffee, they could essentially work together, map the ideal route, know our orders ahead of time, so we can actually focus on the human interaction piece of this and not have to worry about any of the other elements that come with the process and logistics of facilitating a meeting or even ordering the coffee. So that's key, so just remember that, that concept. And finally, as a marketer, one of the things that we have to understand is that it's not just about the human in the center anymore. As these virtual assistants and proxies begin to rise, we're also going to be connecting not only with an individual, but with the, how do you then market to an AI? It's completely different. It's based on different structures, different data inputs. It's less about evoking emotion and more about making sure that the, the, the structure of the data is correct. All right, that's exponential. So we've talked about Empower, which is all about facilitating control. We talked about Exponential, which is all about intelligent systems, AI, data, etc., and how that's gonna drive ease and convenience. Now, we're gonna talk about Enhanced. Enhanced is that connection between blurring of the lines between physical and digital reality. So here we go. So I love the original Matrix back in 1999, you know. Matrix 4, okay, take it or leave it. But this whole idea of living in simulation really got me thinking. And I began to think a lot about the simulation theory. Anyone heard about it? Simulation theory basically states that we're living within some form of computer simulation already. Now, whether or not you believe that, totally fine. But what you're seeing on the screen is the ability to basically spatially map locations and overlay with digital overlays are going to fundamentally transform to where we essentially will be living in various forms of, sim of simulations. So whether you decide to take the blue pill and just continue to live life as you normally would or the red pill and let's see how far the rabbit hole goes in terms of all of this kind of blending. So I'm gonna go red pill. Now, enhanced is about perception. So within this, we're gonna talk about the metaverse, we're gonna talk about computer vision, we're gonna talk about digital twins, we're gonna talk about synthetic reality. Now, a key facet to this right now is really tied to immersive experiences. So currently, you've got Meta, who's really focusing on the VR form factor, like the Oculus, Oculus headset, as a way to drive these kind of connections into introductions into the metaverse. Here's something that's of note. Most people think about VR and gaming. Only 16% of people are actually using VR headsets for gaming. A majority of it is to actually view social content and different experiences within it. And there are limitations though to the virtual headset as you, we all know. You have to be within a specific space and you can't really feel the world around you. So there's this kind of evolution that's happening. So there's one camp that's taking and really trying to 
find a more realistic experience within VR from haptic suits to where you can feel things. I've even seen research around taste. So you can actually taste things and smell things that are happening in these virtual worlds. Um, but what I'm actually looking at, I'm looking at kind of how are we going to evolve from just kind of that specific hardware? And we're going to talk a lot about multimodal interfaces and shifting from desktop and mobile is the primary way which we interface to kind of smart glasses and smart contacts. But before we get there, it's important to realize that what's going to happen is you as an individual are going to begin to kind of parse yourself across these different experiences. How you present yourself in the form of your digital avatar and your digital synth is going to be something that's going to be very unique to these different platforms. Similar to how you may post different content on LinkedIn or Instagram or Snap or TikTok or whatever other platform that you currently use, you have different personas. That's going to be amplified within these immersive experiences and these immersive worlds. How we actually work and how we collaborate is going to shift as well. One thing the pandemic did do is it accelerated this, this drive for collaboration and remote connection. My entire team is remote, everyone I work with. And we have our team meetings within VR. So this is a spatial app, we've tested Horizon, we've tested a number of different platforms that we can kind of work and interact with within, within 3D. Now, but one thing that I, I'm really excited about, take all of the, the, the virtual headsets and those immersive experiences aside for just a moment. To me, one of the fundamental drivers and points of differentiation moving forward is actually going to be tied to computer vision. Computer vision is a subset of AI. You can pull high dimensional elements from the environment around you that drives different forms of decisioning. Going back to the idea of the camera as a bridge to intelligence and the camera as a home screen for Gen Z, what you see on screen right now is Google Lenses. Over 1 billion queries have happened. Google Lens is that little rainbow camera that's at the very top of your Google app on your phone. You can basically open the camera and pull contextual elements from the, the real world around you and basically make sense of what it is. Now, not only is it around understanding the world around you, but you can actually invert that. So think about Google search results for just a moment. You can now augment traditional search results with 3D models that can be dropped into your physical location. Look at this example with muscle flexion on the screen. That was simply a traditional search result that then will also render a, a deeper immersive experience. You may have seen this also on Amazon where you can basically drop different elements of furniture in your room or different eyeglass vendors can take and do virtual try on. Similar concept. Now, what you're seeing on the screen as we move from just kind of deeply immersive headsets to heads up displays or glasses, one thing that needs to happen is we have to autonomously map our physical spaces. Just like the matrix example I showed you previously with the, the different code running all over every structure within the room, we have to fully map our environments around us in order to project these digital overlays onto them. And that's happening. Another way you can insert yourself into these experiences is through volumetric capture. So I've worked with Groove Jones in the past to scan my full body, put myself into these different experiences to have a, you know, a photorealistic avatar within those experiences. But one thing that really impressed me, what you're seeing on the screen now, this is actually a hologram. So this was from South by Southwest earlier this year. And as you can see with Portal, the real me is over on the, on the one side, hologram me, which you can tell has you know, different elements of depth to it in near photorealistic quality is there on the screen as well moving. So Google is also working on this as well. It's this idea of true presence so that in the physical world, you can be rendered and shown in a way that's almost in three dimension. And that's important because as we shift between digital and physical worlds, we have to quickly then take and apply this concept of digital twin to that. So a digital twin is simply a digital representation of a physical experience. What you're seeing on the screen right now was actually the, the full mapping and scanning of a full physical location that is turned into a digital shopping experience. And again, it's bridging the gap between physical and digital. You're seeing, <laughs> you're seeing meta pop up VR headsets in a physical space but you're seeing Nike open virtual stores within Roblox. 
So again, it's this constant blending. Now, I teased this idea of multimodal interfaces previously. What we're seeing now is we're seeing a lot of the major tech players moving towards combining style plus utility. So Meta has partnered with Luxottica and basically with Ray-Ban here to create smart glasses. Apple just presented their smart glass project mirror shade concept to their board of directors recently. So what you're going to see over the next year, you're going to see one of these major tech players release their next iteration of smart glass and a smart glass operating system with the sole purpose of taking and shifting from desktop and mobile to a heads up type of display. So this is incredibly important. All of these fast factors are coming into play. The virtual assistant, the form factor of the actual glass, the ability to map and render experiences in three dimensions. All of this is key. And here's an example from Mini. So even in taking and enhancing and augmenting how you would drive your vehicle, if you don't have a self-driving car yet. So you can see the young lady get into the vehicle and as she starts her drive, it does what you think it does. It pulls up different directions and it helps you kind of navigate the, the physical world around you. But also, if you'll notice here in just a moment, it's integrated into the camera system within the vehicle. So as she looks to her right and there's a skateboarder or impending danger coming through, it actually sees through the car because it stitches these different camera elements together and it just enhances the driving experience. And remember previously when I mentioned that the vehicle is going to become an entertainment center as we head towards you know, autonomous things? Here's an example from Edgy Bees that actually takes the, the concept and idea of driving and turns it into a Mario Kart-like experience. Oh, by the way, that also has a loyalty component with a brand integration at the end with McDonald's here as it's kind of passing by the actual sign and the drive through etc. So you want a free meal, right? In time to turn and go. Now, we're going to continue down this path of mixing reality, blending reality, taking and enhancing our intelligence through both these kind of spatial models as well as AI-powered intelligent systems to the point that we're going to be living in a form of synthetic reality to where my specific preferences are going to be a key driver, again, because we're heading towards this decentralized web that you as an individual own your specific data, your preferences. And ultimately, the world around you just will become more and more customized and tailored to you. It may start as a similar room for everyone, just like you would if you're starting a, a game of you know, The Sims or something else. You start in a, a very, you know, general location. But as the system learns your preferences, as it learns and understands what properties that you're associated with, I like Star Wars and Stranger Things and all these other things, that can then take and enhance your physical world. And the other thing that's going to be really interesting, I'm wearing a black t-shirt right now, but when you put on your specific smart glasses or whatever other form factor there is, I could be wearing a Gucci sweater and off-white Jordans and, you know, have a completely different digital outfit that I'm actually spending more money on the digital clothes that I wear versus the physical. And again, that's tied back to ownership potentially with an NFT that could exist across my avatars or my physical person. So it's really kind of, it's interesting to think about the possibilities as you begin to think about this connection between physical and digital. So how are we going to evolve? How, is, how and when is all of this going to happen? It's already happening. You're seeing the virtual assistant moving to the center of devices, the center of hardware. Not only that, we're moving to, away from kind of the traditional, well, Amazon and Google want us to move away from the traditional app approach to where they're stitching together different experiences based on scenes. Similar to the renting of the car, the intelligent system will take and identify what you're doing and be able to basically predict whatever the next step is going to be in terms of your specific interaction without you having to go and open a, an application. When is all of this going to happen? So I talk to leading tech organizations, private equity firms, luminaries, pretty much everyone across, the, across industry. 
And as I think about the predictions and when these things will hit mass market, originally I was thinking around 2028. But the reality right now with supply chain, where the patents are, where they are in terms of the development of some of the operating systems, you're basically trying to put a supercomputer on your face. You're going to start seeing multimodal interfaces at scale by 2030. You will see precursors like you've seen from Facebook in the market now and especially heading into the next year. So that, that is coming. All right. So that's enhanced. So now we've talked about empower, which is all about control. We've talked about exponential, which is all about intelligent systems. We talked about enhanced, which is all about perception. Now let's talk about how we can shift our mindset to understanding and having an experience centric mindset, because it is going to require a bit of a shift in how we think and even how we apply and think about technology. You may not be a, a, a techie, you know, listening to this conversation or listening to this presentation today. But I do want to give you some foundational steps that you can take and begin to learn a little bit more about specific topics that may impact your business. Now, it's important to understand the way that Web 2.0 worked and the way that a lot of traditional marketing, multi-channel marketing worked, is that each individual experience, each individual channel was almost like an arcade you know, from the 1980s where you could step up to a, to, a con, to a cabinet, play your game, move to the next one, have a completely different experience. Moving forward, the expectation is for truly personalized and omnichannel experiences to where the consumer is in the center and it's all about bringing all of the convenience and all of the relevance to the individual. You can see the chips and the cookies and the screens and everything else is there. And again, we have an expectation for personalized experiences. Gen Z spends two and a half hours a day with on-demand content. And again, this expectation for being able to curate your own experience, it's just a natural extension now of how to think. And again, it's not enough to take a Web 1.0 approach of just putting information out there. You have to continue to bridge physical and digital and immersive experiences in addition to your traditional digital experiences and your strategic approach and, and experiential. Like it all has to tie together in a seamless way to make sure that you're having the biggest impact potential on the audiences that you're trying to reach or trying to activate. Really, really key. Now, taking it back to old school Sesame Street for just a minute, we'll say hello to our friend the Count. <laughs> And there are five ways you can begin to shift your mindset when it comes to thinking about how do I begin to think about technology and apply it to my everyday. Number one, it takes an understanding that just deciding and saying you're going to do it isn't necessarily enough. Willpower enough is not enough. 25% of people stop whatever they're trying to attempt in the first week. 60% give up in the first month. It's incredibly important to set realistic small goals. Pick an article a day. Watch a, a single video and just understand the basics of a core concept. That's what I do whenever I'm looking and evaluating different trends. I break things down to kind of its core foundational elements. And I begin to build it back up with my business or my client's businesses in mind. That's how you begin to find kind of these connections across experiences. The second thing is you're going to have to get a little comfortable with the F word here. And by F word, I mean failure. So this is probably my favorite slide in the entire presentation with Cookie Monster basically shouting an expletive. But understand, you know, you're going to have, as you begin this, this path of understanding technology and how it applies, you know, you may get frustrated at times. You may run into, you know, a brick wall of, of understanding. And that's okay. That's where you can continue to develop and lean into your network or different individuals or continue to look for different information. But just, just because you might fail once, doesn't mean you necessarily give up. Keep moving forward. Have very specific goals is number three. So as you think about your business, as you understand macro level, each of these new concepts and each of these new territories, the metaverse, Web3, NFTs, all these things are happening. There's just things happening every day. Make sure that you understand the needs and wants and desires and behaviors of your consumer. And that'll help dictate some of the channels that are going to be the most relevant as a part of your strategy to align physical and digital. It's a key point. 
It's also incredibly key to experiment. When I talk to different organizations about the integration of technology, you know, there's, there, there used to be, oh, well, we really like this idea. Let's, let's think about it. Well, you have to take and actually drive some type of action, whether it's creating a proof of concept, um, allocating a certain amount of budget just to do innovative, exploratory approaches. Because you have to set the foundation. Sometimes it's just about securing your space in the Wild West, just like with NLP and Alexa and others with some of the, the evoke words, etc., and making sure that your brand is at least discoverable within Google Assistant. Little things like that can be a starting point to where you can then really take and expand upon that through experimentation. And the final thing is to understand experiences are constantly evolving. Technology is rapidly changing. And in order to truly understand how to apply different trends to your core business, it's really important that you understand the foundational elements. You understand kind of the core aspects of what your ultimate business goals are. And what I always recommend, I, I recommend a 70-20-10 approach when you think about putting it all together. So 70% is obviously tried and true, traditional digital and everything that you're doing. 20% are maybe new and emerging, more immersive experiences that may have a vanity KPI associated with it or a key performance indicator. 10% may be just something completely experimental that you want to take and begin applying and trying and building an association. One thing that's really important to note here though as you're thinking about experimentation in gaming or any other specific area, it's not just about the creation of content. It's also about, basically, it's not just about the brand. It's about the individual and connecting it in an authentic way, especially as you're beginning to deal with different communities, etc. That is an incredibly important piece to understand whenever you're trying to activate within these more immersive experiences or in these predefined worlds that already have existing communities. What role will your brand play? How will you be able to take and enhance those experiences? What additional elements of value are you bringing for those individuals? These are key things to think about as you're, as you're continuing to think about the exploration and application of all of these new and emerging things. All right, so now we've reached the point where I want you to get your camera out. So I'm gonna show you a number of QR codes that, are, that will link to different resources that you can get started in learning more about certain areas. So what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about Ethereum, NFTs, the metaverse, AI, digital workforce, and emerging tech. So let's start with Ethereum. Now, crypto's had some ups and downs over the years and a little bit of down here recently, but Ethereum, again, is a core blockchain. The Ethereum blockchain is essential for NFTs. So not only is it kind of a stable coin, but you're actually able to take and drive Ether to purchase NFTs, to issue POAPs, all of these other things that are happening. So if you want more information about Ethereum, be sure to scan the code on the screen. Next is NFTs. This is a how-to guide on all things NFT, from how to purchase, where to purchase, basically what you can do with an NFT, all the way through to even potentially how to mint an NFT. Next, this is a how-to guide specifically for the metaverse. It'll give you just a general deeper understanding of some of the core concepts associated with the metaverse and just provide just additional insight into all the facets of the different communities, the different aspects, digital goods, etc. All right, this QR code is for artificial intelligence. So this is a link to a talk that I've recently given that goes a little bit deeper into the general aspects of AI, from machine learning to deep learning, generative models, etc. Now, we met Anne earlier. So from, synth from synth Synthesia, I always have a hard time pronouncing, um, but they're a fantastic team. So don't let my pronunciation uh, keep you from connecting. The idea of the digital workforce is one that is definitely of interest, especially as more and more that we face worker shortages. How do we derive customer service in a, in a more hyper digital world? This is another great way to kind of think about that. Now, as you think about emerging technology, I create a lot of content. So I've created 600 posts over the last, you know, however many years 
and I create a lot of original content, speak a lot on these various topics. What you see on the screen is an abbreviated version of this talk. This is my TEDx talk that lives on TED.com. So if you want the 13 minute version of this talk, there you go. Here are all six slides. I like to trick my conference goers to assign them on one at the very end, I'll pull up all six and they're like, oh, we could have just done this one. It's always, it's always a good time. And that's, that's it for today. Thank you for taking the time, kind of going through the idea of the evolution of experience, the role of how behavior and emerging technology are going to impact business, the four core filters of empower, which is control, exponential intelligent systems, enhance the linking of physical and digital, and experience how to evolve the mindset. You can stay connected with me on Blackfin360. You can also, which you can scan the QR code here. Or you can find me across social platforms at, at, Black, at Blackfin360. So pretty much wherever there's a social platform, I'm posting content there. But again, thank you for your time and have a great day.